Amen, amen. My only hope is you, Lord. My only joy is in you. My only peace in you. You are all that I need. On this note, I welcome you to the first day of our Excellence in Leadership lecture series. I'm extremely delighted that you can join us for this a very important study. Being the first day of the series, permit me to give a, an, a general introduction to the series before we go into the topic for uh, this evening. But first, allow me to thank the organizers of this event, the young people, particularly those who are based in the United Kingdom, who have established a network amongst themselves from young people across uh, the continent of Europe, the continent of Africa, and even some are listening in from Asia. Your generation presents to the world a very important platform by which we can train leaders in a very short time who would make a difference to the world. And I want to thank you for this initiative. It couldn't have happened perhaps in the past, but now with COVID-19, which has virtually or essentially put everyone online, you have the opportunity to actually train people all over the world and they would be listening because they are all on lockdown. They have nothing else to do. I see in this divine providence, and I want to thank you, the young people, the students, the young professionals in the northern part of the United Kingdom for initiating this event. Since you launched your movement uh, uh, several weeks ago with In These Times, understanding the meaning of now, you've had different programs and I pray that this would continue. Use this platform to educate, to inspire, to challenge a generation to make a difference in the world. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm extremely excited uh, to begin today on the series, 
excellence in leadership. Excellence in leadership. Let me begin by saying it is not a sermon. It is a study. And I'll be speaking very candidly to you. The days are over when we settle for mediocrity. We are pushing for excellence. There's too much mediocrity, chicken mindset in the church, in our schools, in our communities, workplaces, even in the running of our governments. We need to move beyond chicken mindset to the mindset of eagles, from mediocrity to excellence. And we've chosen excellence in leadership. This means we are going to study, and I expect you to take a piece of paper and a pen. You'll be taking notes. Don't just sit anywhere and listen. I am confident that if you take these studies seriously, by the grace of God, you will be inspired. You will be challenged to emerge as a leader in your own right wherever you are. We are going to study the book of Nehemiah. Perhaps you are going to look at this book in a way you have never done before. I have eight presentations to make on this platform, but I wish we really had much more time. You need to know uh, that um, before the current work I am doing, directing a center for leadership development, I was also directing campus ministries, and we were based at the University of Michigan. We had a missionary training program, and we studied this book four hours a day for two weeks. In effect, we put in about 40 hours studying the book of Nehemiah to understand the principles of leadership. As a result of the studies, it impacted the students so much so that literally almost everyone who passed through our program emerged as a leader in their own right. Regardless of which field of study they pursue, engineering, medicine, graphic design, arts, political science, whatever field they chose, as a result of the studies we are about to embark upon, they emerged as leaders in their own right. And through a network of their friends, a series of grassroots movements emerged. These became global grassroots youth empowerment movement. And some of these movements spilled over to Africa, to Europe, to Australia, New Zealand, all over. All because as a result of the principles here, the Holy Spirit impressed upon these young people to rise up and be leaders in their generation. My prayer is that those of you who are students and young professionals, you would rise up and pursue excellence in leadership and make a difference in our generation. After my work at uh, the university directing campus ministries, about nine years ago, I embarked upon a new line of work, directing two centers of leadership development called EAGLES and then ANANSI. EAGLES is an acronym. It stands for Empowerment and Advisory Group for Leadership, Excellence, and Service. And ANANSI, it's also an acronym, African Network and Advisory for Needed Services and Excellence. These two centers are the platform that I currently use directing Eagles Online. You see me wearing our, t our, our, our shirt, Eagles Online, Empowerment and Advisory Group for Leadership, Excellence and Service. These are the ingredients of our, our training, leadership development, excellence, not mediocrity, and service. And service, we are talking about sacrificial, selfless service. That is what we do. And I want to point out that 
I give leadership training seminars also and lectures all over the world. We serve as a leadership training consultancy for institutions such as universities, government agencies, businesses and companies, NGOs and churches. And we are paid to do this work. What you are going to get for free, people pay for it. And so you, you better take this seriously. Currently, or in the past, we have served as a consultant, youth leadership consultant to the African Union. In 2016, we were invited to help the African Union Youth Department begin to train a generation of Africans to be leaders instead of being mediocre. I've given lectures on major universities, public universities, private universities, denominational institutions, religious institutions. But the lectures are all designed to train leaders. The past two years, we've been serving as consultants and youth leadership training for YALI West Africa. YALI is an acronym for Young African Leaders Initiative. It was launched by President Obama to train the next generation of African leaders, young people. It has since been folded into the US State Department, which is reaching out to Africa, trying to train a new generation of African leaders. Because it's quite apparent that most of our leaders since independence have not been excellent. And Yali has at least four centers. In West Africa, for the West African English speaking, the headquarters is in Ghana. In East Africa, the headquarters is in Nairobi. Southern Africa, Johannesburg. And for the Francophone French speaking countries, the headquarters is in Senegal. I've served as a consultant and I train the cream of the crop young people in leadership. Ghana's former president, President Kufuo, also has a program called Kufuo Scholars Program, of which leadership development is key. Eagles Online, we serve as consultants and we also train the next generation of African leaders being groomed in Ghana. In addition, there is a network called Africa Arise Network, consisting of Christians of different denominations who seek to address African problems from a biblical perspective. Eagles Online is actively involved in that as well. So from the Ethiopia headquarters, Rwanda, Zambia, Kenya, all of these, we offer leadership training for them. Churches including bigger churches, mega churches, not belonging to our denomination, also invite us to train their youth and their members across the continent of Africa. I'm telling you this to let you know, leadership development is key. If our church doesn't take it seriously, others are taking it seriously. And if you are not a leader, you'll be a follower. And so yours is, a unique opportunity to rise up as a generation in our church, as a generation on our continent to make a difference. There's too much mediocrity, averageness. And in the church, I call it the father Abrahamization of Christianity. We treat young people, students, as if they are tiny little kids. And so I'll be speaking to you bluntly, and candidly. This is going to be a study, not a sermon. I invite you to take a piece of paper and a pen. We are going to study the Bible. And my ultimate prayer is that what has happened in the past 
through campus ministry with the emergence of a generation of young people and grassroots movement who are impacting the world to this day, you can also rise up in this generation. What is going on around us? on the continent of Africa and beyond. And by the way, I offer the same training to China and of course of other places. You can be part of it. And once again, I am extremely excited that you, the young people of Northern England, caught a vision that you are going to network amongst your fellow students and young professionals to offer a new direction of excellence, not only in your church, but amongst your peers around the world. I pray that this week will be a blessing to you. There's so much to cover because we are going to try to crush into eight hours or so material worth about 40 hours. But I know the Holy Spirit will be the teacher and he is going to teach us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the next few minutes, as we launch into a study of your word, let your Holy Spirit, the comforter and the teacher himself, be our teacher. We pray that as a result of this study, a whole new movement will emerge, a generation, a new generation in our era, who would impact whatever spheres of engagement they find themselves. Bless each one of us, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's begin. Why are we going to study the book of Nehemiah? To discover principles of leadership. Why is this book particularly important when we are planning to study excellence in leadership? Let me give you a couple of reasons. First of all, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. Of course, in our English Bible, they were split apart. Why should we study the book of Nehemiah? Number one, it is part of the Bible. And it contributes to the totality of God's message in scripture. Every book of the Bible has a unique message. And the Bible teaches us that all scripture is inspired by God. It is profitable for doctrine, for instruction. Everything pertaining to godliness, the Bible has a say, has the answer. And the book of Nehemiah is one of the books of the Bible. Perhaps you need to know that every Bible book contributes a unique emphasis to the totality of the Bible message. If I, I, I was sitting directly before you giving a, like, I would ask you, which book of the Bible, there are 66 books of the Bible, which of the books of the Bible would you read if you want practical wisdom for everyday life? Which book would it be? The book of Proverbs, it has some practical advice for us. All other books does the same, but the book of Proverbs, you see it compacted. Which book of the Bible would you read when you seek guidance in marital affections, intimacy, relationship, love? Which book would you go to? Certainly the Song of Songs by Solomon. Which book of the Bible would you go if you want counsel how to be a pastor, pastoral leadership? The books of Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy, it teaches how you can be an effective pastor. And which book of the Bible would you focus on if you want to discover principles of excellence in leadership it is the book of Nehemiah. So why should we study the book of Nehemiah? It is part of the Bible. It offers leadership par excellence principles on that. But there's another reason why we are focusing on leadership. There is a crisis of leadership everywhere and the book of Nehemiah is relevant for our time. We need spiritual leaders in the home. 
We need spiritual leaders in the church. Pastors, elders, department leaders. We need these principles if we are to run our churches. We need leaders at the workplace. Whether you are a teacher or a nurse, a principal in a school, a supervisor, a CEO of a company, or you are running an NGO, non-governmental agencies. If you are into youth leadership development, running student government, student representative councils, you need the principles of this book to run it. If you are in government and you want to run our nations as a member of parliament, as a judge, as a journalist, whatever pertains to the governance of a nation, you need the principles of leadership. And the book of Nehemiah is relevant for our time. It sets the tone for every organization. If you want to know why organizations and churches and nations are not running well, trace it to leadership. You can tell any institution, any church that is not doing well, look at its leader. That person reveals a lot about their church. There's an African proverb, a Ghanaian one, an army of sheep led by a lion can defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. Think about it. If you have a pack of sheep and their commander is a lion and they are going to fight a group of lions and they are being led by a sheep, the one who is a leader, the lion leader would defeat lions who are being led by sheep. Unfortunately, today we are being led by sheep leadership at every rank of society. But leadership is not about you. It begins with you. I'm giving you some quotes we use at our Eagles online training program. Leadership is not about you, but it begins with you. A good leader trains others to succeed them. But a great leader trains others to supersede them. You not only train your successor, that's a good leader, but you must train your successor to be better than you. That is the mark of a great leader. Africans don't train their successors. We are presidents for life. And those who train their successors at all, they don't train them to do better than them. We need a leadership training that would affect these two. We need leadership. You are a leader because you influence people to the extent that you influence people, you are already a leader. The question is, what kind of leader are you? Do you excel in leadership? This training is talking about how you can excel in leadership. Being a leader is not easy. As leaders, we must know what to do when the task before us seems impossible, humanly impossible. You must know how to combine divine factors with human effort. True leadership includes God enabling you with your abilities and skills to accomplish a task the combination of divine and human. You must know how to plan your work and work your plan, while at the same time relying fully upon God. You must know how to motivate people to join you in the work, how to deal with discouragement in ourselves and also in others, how to handle opposition, false accusations and attack, you must know how to promote or how to deal with promotion and also failure. A good leader must know what to do when their efforts all fail because of enemy attack, what should you do? These are the hallmarks of good leadership. And the book of Nehemiah presents us with insights 
about leadership par excellence. When we study the book of Nehemiah, and in the next couple of days, you are going to discover the power of prayer, the power of courage, determination in reaching God's goal. You are going to see a man who displays commitment as a leader, a man who is able to influence people, move people, lead people to accomplish an objective. You are going to see a man who displays practical wisdom, an ability to make realistic plans and get things done. We are going to learn how to plan our work, how to organize our time and our resources, how it to integrate our duties in a total operation of work and motivate others and measure our results, whether we are heading there or not. You are going to discover what to do when you take on a new assignment, how to conduct yourselves in a delicate and trying situations and how to handle opposition. The book of Nehemiah is incredibly amazing. No secular training, no seminar or webinar on some of these MBA programs can offer you this training. And you don't become a leader by simply taking a course or having a degree. So why study the book of Nehemiah is part of the Bible. There is a crisis of leadership everywhere, and we need the principles. But the book of Nehemiah is also particularly important and relevant for the Christian and the Christian church. At a time of crumbling walls, we need principles to teach us as a church. You know, a, 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 a church is not just a con a congregation of people, or it is not just a building, a roof meeting place, an auditorium or worship space. That is not a church. A church is not just a denomination, a federation of like-minded or like-minded congregations who are there for a purpose. No, the Bible, when it talks about a church, it is a special people. A called out people, the Greek is ecclesia, a spiritual Israel, as it were. And that's why Jesus said he would establish his church founded on himself. So when we say we need leadership in the church, we are not talking about a denomination, we are not talking about a particular group of people assembled in a particular space. And today, in this era of COVID-19 and lockdowns, the church is now a church without walls. And you better believe it. If you are still under the illusion that your church is just one tiny little congregation or big congregation somewhere, and you hold the power and you can do anything, you are mistaken. A church today is a church without walls. And technology has made it possible. Whatever used to be accomplished in local organized group can now be effectively done using technology. And so we need the principles of leadership to run this as well. And God's time and time church, the Seventh-day Adventist church must also study about leadership. Ellen White says, in the book, Christian Service, page 177, paragraph one, she says, there is a need of Nehemiahs in the church today. Not men who can pray and preach only, but men whose prayers and sermons are braised with firm and eager purpose. And she says the course that was pursued by this Hebrew patriot called Nehemiah in the accomplishment of his plans is one that should still be adopted by ministers leading men. We need Nehemiahs today. And when God raises you up as a Nehemiah, as a leader, you are going to face obstacles. And Ellen White continues by saying, the experience of Nehemiah is repeated in history of God's people in this time. Those who labor in the cause of truth will find that they cannot do this without exciting the anger of its enemies. Though they have been called by God to do the work in which they are engaged, 
and their cause is approved of him, they cannot escape reproach and derision. When you emerge as a leader, make no mistake, everyone will be after you. My mother tells me, it is fruitful mango trees that have stones thrown at them. If you see little kids throwing stones at a tree, it's because there are fruits that are ripe over there. If you are bearing no fruit, no one throws stones at you. Nehemiahs in the last days are going to be attacked. You better believe it. How do you handle it? In a way that is pleasing to the Lord. This is why we study this book, Excellence in Leadership. And God has given us a leadership manual, the book of Nehemiah. Let me give you a quick overview of the book. There are many ways you can study this book. If you focus on the building, the building project and the people, you can divide the book as part one, chapters one to six. There are 13 chapters in the book of Nehemiah. Chapters one to six will focus on building Jerusalem's wall. Chapter seven to 10, renewing of Jerusalem's worship. Chapters 11 to 12, repopulating Jerusalem's streets. And chapter 13, renewal of Jerusalem's people, even after they failed. If you study the book from the lens of leadership, then you can organize the book this way. The leader and his prayer life, chapter one. The leader and organization, chapter two. The leader and his work, chapters three to four A. The leader and opposition from outside, chapters four and six. The leader and opposition from within, chapter five. The leader and personal attacks, chapter six. The leader and renewal revival, chapter seven to 12. The leader and reformation, chapter 13. In the course of studying it along these lines of leadership, you are going to discover the call of a leader, how God calls a leader. The planning of a leader, how the leader plans his work. The work of a leader, how he works their plan. The character of a leader, selfless, sacrificial character. You are going to see the endurance of a leader under opposition, internal, external, every form. You see the spirituality of a leader, his real character, the joy of a leader, and the legacy of a leader, how you measure the impact of your work. This week, I'm going to organize them under eight study materials. And because I'm speaking to Christian people, my thrust will be about revival and reformation in the end time. And so in my first presentation, I'll focus on the walls are down. Today, I'll be talking about the walls are down. We are going to focus on chapter one. Then tomorrow, we are going to deal with, come, let us build. Chapters two to four. By the way, you must read chapters two to four before you come tomorrow. And then champions are few. We are going to discover the mark of a real leader and uh, well, you'll come to that. I cannot come down is another topic. We are going to talk about how a leader deals with critics and opposition. Watchmen over Zion, chapter seven. Time for revival, chapters eight to nine. Re marching on Zion's wall, chapters 10 to 12. And repairers of the bridge, chapter 13. That is what we are going to do. But for now, I am going to start with the first presentation. All that I've covered so far is to at least attempt to convey to you that the studying of leadership is important. And now we are going to begin the book of Nehemiah. This first presentation is entitled, The Walls Are Down. The Walls Are Down. Take your Bible. We are going to read Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Nehemiah chapter one, verses one to four. We are going to ask the question, why are the walls down? How did they get down? What can we do when the walls are down and crumble? What does it take to rebuild broken walls? Who is Nehemiah and what did he do in his day? And what can we learn from him? 
Today's presentation, I will give you a long historical background so you would understand how the book unfolds. Take your Bibles, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It reads, reading from the New King James Version. The words of Nehemiah, by the way, Nehemiah in the Hebrew means the comfort of the Lord. The comfort of the Lord or comforted by the Lord, the variants of that. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaleah, it came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down. That's why I got the title for today, The Walls Are Down. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Verse 4, so when it was, when I heard these words that I, Nehemiah speaking, I sat down, I wept, I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Why are the walls down? Why did Nehemiah have to weep and pray? What was going on? To understand this, a little historical background. I would assume that you don't know any Bible because quite frankly, many young people today don't know the Bible. So I'll give you a little background. You see, Israel, ancient Israel, consisted of 12 tribes. Think of ancient Israel as the United Kingdom of Israel. How did it become Israel? They, they, they are the ancestors of Jacob. Jacob was one crooked young man, perhaps an African. But God changed his life and changed his name from Jacob into Israel. And so his descendants were called Israelites. And of the 12 sons of Jacob who constituted the nation Israel, their first king was called King Saul, a bright, good-looking man from the tribe of Benjamin. He started out pretty well, but then he messed up on the way. So God took the kingdom and gave it to a little shepherd boy called David. David did his best, was not always right, messed up along the way, but God through his mercy led him to repentance, change his life, and he left us a legacy to learn from his life. But after David, the kingdom was given to his son, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, though he often lived as a fool. He made many blunders in life. But thank God, he repented, God saved him. And through him, he has left behind a legacy of material we can learn from Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, we can learn from his mistakes. Solomon expanded the territory of Israel, very large and wide. But when Solomon died, there was a civil war in Israel, the United States, the 12 states of Israel. There was a civil war led by one agricultural minister, defense minister, one of them, you know, staged a coup because Solomon's son, who took the throne, his name was Rehoboam. It starts with an R, Rehoboam. When he started out as a son of Solomon, he was doing very well, but along the way, he dismissed his father's advisors who were guiding him. He thought they were too old. They didn't need their, their, their skills. He got some young boys from University of uh, 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 wherever, Oxford, Cambridge, wherever. They, he got the brightest you know, scholars of those days to surround him. And the first advice they gave him as new experts, they said, look, fire your father's advices. They are not good for the 21st century of our time in his days. And he didn't have any brain either. So he went along with whatever he was being taught by these new scholars. 
And then they also advise him, increase the taxes of the people. And if your father was gentle with them, you be very stern on them. And he followed them. And when he started this, there was a revolt in the kingdom. Ten tribes broke away from Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And the ten tribes in the north, they took the name Israel. And then their capital was Samaria. Their king was Jeroboam with a J. Only two kingdoms or two tribes remained with Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. They retained, uh, they took for themselves the name Judah. Their capital, Jerusalem. Their king, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Let's see whether you remember this because it's important to remember this. There was a civil war in the 12 tribes of Israel, the United Kingdom after Solomon. We say 10 of the tribes were in the north. Which name did they choose for themselves? Israel. Their capital, Samaria. Who was their first king? Jeroboam. Two tribes remained of the original kingdom. They took for themselves as their name, Judah. Their capital, Jerusalem. They were in the south. And their king was Rehoboam. Though now we have a divided kingdom, God still viewed the two kingdoms or two nations as his own. So he will send prophets to Israel. He will send prophets to Judah, telling them, come back. Don't go astray. After all the pleas of the Lord, they did not listen. And so in 722 BC, God sent the Assyrians, the superpower of those days, to go and discipline the northern kingdom, Israel. They literally wiped them off the scale. Israel was finished, 722 BC. Only Judah remained. For 136 years, God was sending prophets, pleading with Judah, Judah, change your mind. Otherwise, what happened to your big sister Israel would happen to you. But Judah would not listen. And so in 586 BC, after 136 years, when Judah left the screen, God sent the Babylonians and they came. And they came and literally demolished Judah, destroyed the city, took several of the people into captivity. They left only old people behind. You can read the biblical history in the last chapter of Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 36, from verse 15 to 21. Let me read it so you get a sense of this. Second Chronicles chapter 36 from verse 15 to 21. It records the last days and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. It reads, and the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early, sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God was warning them. He cared for them. But, verse 16, they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words. They scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people because there was no more remedy. Their probation was essentially closed. There was nothing more God could do. Then verse 17, therefore he, God, brought upon the king of the Chaldeans, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion upon the young man and the maiden, or old man, and him that stood for eight. He gave them all into his hand. Verse 18, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king, his princes, all these, he brought them to Babylon. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. So we are talking about the walls are down. When were they down? Babylon broke down all the walls. He broke down the walls of Jerusalem, bent all the palaces thereof with fire, destroyed all the goodly vessels. Verse 20, 
And them that had escaped from the sword, he carried to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate. She kept the Sabbath for 70 years. So the walls were down. Who broke them? Babylon. Why did he break them? God gave them into his hand because Israel had disobeyed God. And so Judah went into captivity or in exile, except a few tiny ones who were left behind. For 70 years, the walls remained down. During the 70 years of captivity, God raised up prophet. Ezekiel was in exile with those who have gone into exile. And through the prophet Ezekiel, he kept saying, don't give up God's people. God will bring you back after 70 years. God raised up another prophet, Daniel, who was working with the heads of states from Babylon to Medo-Persia or the Persian kings reminding the global superpower leaders, you better take care, don't mess up with God's people. Though he has disciplined them, he is, they are still beloved of God. He raised up Jeremiah on the homeland amongst those who had remained, telling them, don't give up hope. Don't repeat the mistakes. God will restore your land. For 70 years, the land remained. And then came after 70 years, in order that for the prophecy of Jeremiah to be fulfilled, God raised up the Persian rulers, the Medo-Persians as it were. They came and attacked Babylon and the Persians started ruling the whole world. You can read it in 2 Chronicles 36 from verses 23 to 22 to 23. And one Persian ruler by the name Cyrus, the first king as it were, came and he issued a decree as soon as he got to the position he said i am now giving amnesty freedom emancipation to all israelites all jews as it were god has placed a burden on my heart that i should go and help you build your temple for the great god you can read all about it in uh, ezra chapter one and so when the decree went out, you can now go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Zerubbabel, in 536 BC, decided to go. There were 50,000 people who were in Ezra who followed him, and they went back to their homeland, Judah. They started building the temple, but they stopped because of discouragement. So the wall was still down. 80 years later, God raised up another man by the name Ezra, who diagnosed the problem, why they couldn't build. He said it was a spiritual problem. So he brought revival so that they can get back to the temple work. But they didn't get to build the wall. So 70 years in exile, the walls were down. Zerubbabel came. Another 80 years later, no one did. So 150 years, the walls were still down. Then came another man called Nehemiah 14 years after Ezra came. It was Nehemiah who would come and do the work. This brings us to the first four verses of the book of Nehemiah. Up until that time, the walls had been down for about 164 years. No one was able to do anything about it. And you are going to discover Nehemiah took less than four months to accomplish the work that had defied logic for 164 years. This is the background to the book of Nehemiah. Now let's go back to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Notice verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, I, Nehemiah, I was in Shushan, the citadel, the capital. The Persians had two capitals. One was in Shushan, another one was in another location. And then what was the condition? While Nehemiah was there working in the palace, 
He got some visitors who had come from Judah, the home town. Verse two and three says, Hanani, one of my brothers, came with men from Judah, and when they came, Nehemiah asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped. And he asked them, how are they doing? How is Jerusalem? How are our people? It's like, okay, I'm a Ghanaian. And then people come from Ghana. And then I ask them quickly, how, how is Ghana doing? How is the nation? How, how, how's everything? Nehemiah is living in the diaspora exile. And this dress come. And he asks, how is Jerusalem? How are its people? And they replied, the survivors who are left are in great distress. They are in reproach, very discouraged. The walls are down. The gates have been burned up. And what did Nehemiah do? Verse 4. So it was. When I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Why did he mourn? Why did he pray? Why did he fast for many days? Because the walls, after 164 years, they were still down. The people were demoralized. They could have done this work. They didn't do it. But why was he so discouraged? Because at the time of Nehemiah, there was another problem. Over the years, there had been discouragement. But at the time of Nehemiah, another Persian ruler had emerged. And this Persian ruler united with the opposition. You know, there were nations in Judah. When Judah was taken into exile, other foreign nations went and occupied their lands. And so when the returnees came and they started building, these enemies were frustrating their effort. By the time of Nehemiah, these enemy nations have ganged up together and connived and lied about Israel for the king in Persia. Sometimes you say Babylon because Babylon was uh, an image, was, was subsumed and was consumed, was folded into Persia. These enemies who were over there managed to convince the king in Persia to issue a decree that no one should build Jerusalem. Even though the Persian king Cyrus years ago had given them permission to go and build, now this ruler issued a decree that no one should build the city. Perhaps we should read it. It is important because if you want to know what Nehemiah was praying about, he didn't just start praying and uh, praying in tongues and do all some of this ridiculous nonsense we see in our churches today. His prayer was definite. There was a reason why. Turn to the book of Ezra. When you go to the book of Ezra, which is just before Nehemiah, in chapter four of Ezra, it would detail the opposition the people of Judah faced from the time when they were given permission to go back, from the time of Zerubbabel all the way. When you read verse 4 of Ezra 4, the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Verse 6. In the reign of Ahasuerus, this was the time of Esther, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 7, Ezra chapter 4. In the days of Ataxerxes, this is the king who was there when Nehemiah was working. In the days of Ataxerxes also, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabel and the rest of their companions wrote to Ataxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script, translated into the Aramaic language. Rehum was the commander, Shimshai the scribe. They wrote a letter against Jerusalem to the king Ataxerxes. And then you, you can read the letter, well-crafted. It was a political document, well-crafted. I'll read the letter to you, verse 11. Notice. These are a coalition of nations who were in Palestine, who were living alongside the people of Judah. They were mad that Judah had come back and there are people who are trying to build. So they ganged up 
and lied and wrote a letter which they sent to the Persian king because he was ruling the whole world. Here is what the letter said from verse 11 of Ezra chapter 4. To the king at Texas, from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth. So they are saying, Mr. President, at Texas, we represent the people who are on the other side of your kingdom. We have a concern we want to bring to your attention. Verse 12, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are rebuilding the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls, and they are repairing the foundations. Let it be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay taxes, they will not pay tribute as, or custom as the king's treasure will be diminished. And because we received support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king. So Mr. President, we are telling you, these people are going to stage a coup. They will not pay taxes, but we don't want that. We support you. So this is why we are writing to you. Verse 15, that a search be made in the book of the records of your fathers. And you will find in the book of records that, that and know that this city is a rebellious city. It is harmful to kings and provinces and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and if its walls were completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. I mean, if you are the president of Tarsus, others, and you have received this memo from all these nations, what would you do? Verse 17, Ataxas sent a reply. The king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, to the rest of the companions who dwell in Samaria. And so he said, this is my reply to all of you. Verse 18, peace be unto you. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me. And I gave the command and a search has been made. And it was found that this city, referring to Jerusalem, in former times has revolted against kings and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river and tax, uh, tribute, and custom were paid to them. Verse 21, now he's coming to issue an order. Now, give the command to make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Verse 22, take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the head of kings? And so the king basically issued a decree, cause the people of Judah to stop all the rebellion work. And so when the enemies got this letter, verse 23, now when the copy of King Ataxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews, and by the force of arms, they made them seize the work. Verse 24, Thus the work of the house of God, which is Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of the riots. And so the king has issued a decree. I was reading from Ezra chapter 4. King has issued a decree, and that situation has made the condition worse. No one should rebuild. No one. So what, why was the wall still down? After all the discouragement and the 164 years, the bigger problem was that a new king of the Persians has now issued a decree for them to stop. And the laws of the Medes and Persians, no one can revoke it. It was at this time that the Bible says Nehemiah lived. As a matter of fact, he was working for the king. Perhaps the king did not fully know that he was a Jew. He was working for the king. And so Nehemiah knew there was a problem, big problem. When the visitors from Judah came, Hanani and his friends, and they said the walls are still down, the people are demoralized, Nehemiah wept. What can we do? There is this decree. The problem person is this king I'm working for. 
So what would he do? He wept. He mourned. He didn't just weep. He mourned. It pained him. He fasted. The Bible says for many days. As he was fasting and praying, it hit him that he could be the answer to the problem. He was working for the king and the king trusted him. But there was a problem. Even if he, 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 he rose, he was not a builder. And he lived far away, more than 800 miles away from Judah. Even if he had the means and the resources and he sent it all to Judah, it will not work. Those of you from Ghana, you know, you live overseas, you send money to Ghana, your relatives to build you a house or something, and they mess up with it. So you have to be on the ground. Nehemiah was not on the ground. He was not a builder. And the laws of the Medes and Persians cannot be revoked. That is why in another instance, Daniel, his friends conspired against him. And the king of Persia at that time knew Daniel was innocent. But because he had issued a decree and he couldn't go back on it, Daniel was put in the lion's den. Nehemiah knew that the laws of the Medes and Persians are irrevocable. So he started praying. Lord, do something about it. The first thing God can do is perhaps do something about the decree. And with a trained eye, Nehemiah was a professional. With a trained eye, perhaps from political science and law, he went back to read the decree of King Artaxerxes, which he passed years ago. And as he read it, he had a little hope. Let's go back to the decree the king passed. And let's see whether you catch the glimmer of hope. Ezra chapter 4, verse 21. That was the decree the king Artaxerxes gave to the opponents to stop the work. It reads, now gave the command to make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. I hope you saw a little hope there. A taxes decree said, no one should build this city until I give another command. Immediately, Nehemiah's hope emerged. If only God can touch the heart of a taxes and he can issue a new decree, it will not contradict the previous one because the previous decree, the previous law, there was a little loophole there. I believe God work on the heart of the king to put that there. And the loophole says, no one should build the city until I give another order. And so Nehemiah started praying. He started praying because he said, if God can touch the heart of this man, perhaps there's a way out. And look at the prayer. Actually, he started praying from verse five onwards. Go back to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter one. Today is a little longer because I'm giving you the background. From verse five, he starts praying. Verse four says, when he heard the news, let's start from verse four, Nehemiah one from four. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down, I wept, I mourned for many days. I was fasting, I was praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, oh great and awesome God, you keep covenant and mercy with those you love and who observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your, ear, your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I'm praying before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel. We have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I prayed, word, that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out of the farthest part of the heaven, yet I'll gather them back from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your great hand. Verse 11, oh Lord, he was concluding his prayer. Oh Lord, I pray, please 
let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, Nehemiah, and to the prayer of your servants, plural, which means Nehemiah was praying with his small prayer team. Be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who desire the fear of your name. And let your servant prosper this day. You know, the NIV says, grant us success this day. Let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. If you listen closely to the prayer, this day, grant me mercy. Every day when Nehemiah went to work, he said, Lord, do something about the situation today. And he says, grant me mercy in the sight of this man. Who is this man? A tax says. The man he was working for, who was the obstacle to the rebuilding project, grant me success this day. Today, every day Nehemiah would wake up. He prayed. He had his friends. They were praying. Today, Lord, as I go to work, open the door, work a miracle on the heart of this man. Because he stood before this project. He was standing in the way as he prayed for this day. This day became day and night. Read it in verse 6. His prayer became day and night. Verse 4, it became many days. And each day, by the time you reach chapter 2 tomorrow, it was about three to four months he prayed. He never quit. Pray, pray, pray. Look, are you facing some challenges and there is some, this man standing in the way. It can be your boss at work. Standing in the way of your promotion or your well-being. It can be somebody in your community, in your government, who thinks they have all the power in the world to do whatever they want. He may be that, this man. You've got to pray. If you don't believe in prayer, you better believe it. Prayer works miracles. Do you have a big problem you are facing? A problem that has defied solution for years, even 160 years. Are you far away from a situation you need to be there to solve the problem, but you are far away and you don't know what to do? Is somebody standing your way? Do what Nehemiah did. Leaders pray. They pray. And they enlist others to join them. It is a no long ranger. Leadership is not one person. It isn't one person doing their own thing. Get others involved. He prayed. He prayed. And as he prayed, it dawned on him that he was the answer. Notice his prayer. I pray, grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And then he added, I was the king's cup bearer. Tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about cup bearer because I need to wrap up. Perhaps I should just say, a cup bearer was not just a person who gave the king juice to drink or food to drink. He was the most trusted person of the, uh, uh, to the king. Because kings were poisoned in those days, their food, the, the, the cup bearer was the one who tasted their drink and their food. If there's poison, he would rather die than the king. But some people also did not just poison the food in the kitchen. They went to the market where the king bought his food items and poisoned the food over there. So the cup bearer also went to the market. He had to choose the right people who would sell the product. In some cases, he had to go to the farm where the products, the, 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 the produce were made because he, did, he didn't want it to be poisoned at source. So the cup bearer's work was like military intelligence. He was like agricultural minister. He was like a minister of business. He being the most trusted person, he was like the secretary of state. He was in actual fact, the one who ran the nation. So when Nehemiah just said in casual, oh, I was the king's cabinet, he was just being very gentle. 
He was the most important person. And then he started praying. He knew he was the answer. And he said, Lord, grant me success. Grant me favor. Prosper me. He made himself available. Lord, I am willing. If there is this problem, I'm willing to be the solution. What does it take for God to call a leader? Let me give you some quick points and we wrap up. Perhaps I'll continue from this tomorrow. Whenever God wants a work to be accomplished, he always prepares workers and puts them in the right place at the right time. There was a big problem, but there was a solution. At Taxes, the king was the problem, but right in the palace, God had prepared somebody to be the solution. Principle, whenever there is a problem and you identify the problem, you are the answer. He prepares people at the right time. Esther was there at Shushan when there was a problem. Joseph was in Egypt when there was a problem. Daniel was in Babylon when there was a problem. Nehemiah was in Susan when there was a problem. God had already prepared. Look, right now, your generation is the right generation to solve the problem of the world today. Whenever there's a problem, there is an answer, and you are the answer. But what does it take? It takes more than an influential, well-connected person. Nehemiah, obviously, was educated. He was very influential. He was brilliant, but he was also spiritual. It takes a true man of God to rebuild the walls. Remember, Nehemiah lived in the time of the luminaries of Greece, Xenophon, Plato, Demosthenes. All these great men were contemporaries of Nehemiah, but their names do not appear in the Bible. You won't find Plato's name in the Bible. You'll find Ezra, you'll find Nehemiah. They were all contemporaries. In fact, during the period of Ezra and Nehemiah, we had got, Buddha was in India. Confucius was in China. Socrates was in Greece, but none of them had their name in the Bible. So don't think when you study philosophy or religious leaders, etc., that makes you a leader. No. Leadership, it is a spiritual leadership founded upon the principles in God's word. Nehemiah was a great leader because as you are going to discover, he had a divine perspective on things. Verse one of Nehemiah chapter one, when he said, I was in the palace in the month of Kislev. In the month of Kislev was a Hebrew month. In Bible times, their calendars were not January, February, March, April, May, June. Kislev was their ninth month, which begins you know, from November, December. The Hebrew calendar was different from the Persian one. But when Emma was in Persia, he did not mark time by the, by, by the Persian calendar but by Jewish calendar. He did not allow the world to determine his schedule. His mind was always focused on God's timetable. He was in a palace, one of the largest posh palaces of the kingdom. There was Susan, which was the winter palace. And then there was another one, Ekbatana, which was the summer palace. Susan was about 5,000 acres. He lived a luxurious, privileged life. But his concern was on God's people who had been demoralized. A leader cares about his people. What does it take to be a man or woman of God? Nehemiah was one ordinary person whose heart was in the right place. He had been trained, but he knew his training was to be put to the service of God. And when did God call him to do something? It was just one regular day. And you are going to discover from tomorrow. He was doing his own business every day, but he kept praying, let today be that day when you work on the heart of this man. God may call you to leadership any day. 
He will call you to leadership when you are home, when you are at work, when you are at school. It was a routine, regular day when Nehemiah was doing his business and visitors came from Judah and he asked a little question and that question turned his life around. God chose to call him to leave his work and be a governor. God can choose you any day. Therefore, you must greet each day with expectancy. Today may be your day when God will call upon you to do something. It was just a regular day. Moses went to care for a sheep, but that day he had the Lord calling him to be a prophet. It was a regular day. David had come home from shepherding his flock. That one day he became the king of Israel. He was anointed. It was a regular day. Peter, James, John, Andrew, they were mending fishermen nets. But that one day, God called them to be fishers of men. Even tragedy, death, can be occasion for God to call people. We are told, in the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord, and the Lord said, who shall I send who would go? Sometimes death, including COVID-19, God can use the tragedy to call you to a, to a new assignment to be a scientist, a leader in the scientific field, to offer new solutions to problems. Economic problems, God can call you from economics, from accounting, to be a leader. Any day. And remember, it began with a simple question. He just asked, how is home? How are the people back home doing? How is the world? And that simple question turned things around. Questions. Some of us are afraid of asking questions, to know the facts. And no wonder God cannot use that. But if you care enough to find out what is going on, God can use that situation to turn you around. You can be reading a newspaper article. You can be watching a news program, and suddenly the scene you see or what you read will stir your heart. And God will say, that is the time I'm calling you to do something about it. It can be a visit, just going on a visit to a group somewhere, and you see something, and God says, you are the answer. Nehemiah was called on a regular day to do something. Perhaps I should pause here. There's still more to be said. But I'll pause here because we'll continue tomorrow. There are lessons in this chapter one, important lessons about prayer, how to pray. If there's time, I'll walk you through the prayer of Nehemiah. You are going to discover the prayer he prayed were not just cheap prayers we pray. It began with praising the Lord. You are awesome God, verse 5. Begin with adoration and praise. He confessed the sin of the people. And it wasn't just their sin, because he had nothing to do with what led them to uh, the exile in this. He said, we have sinned. He included himself. It was based on the promises of God. Lord, you have promised in the book of Moses that if we do this, this is what will happen. But if we change our ways, this is what will So his prayer was informed by the word of God. Many of our prayers today lack biblical foundation. And if your prayer is not founded on the word of God, Satan would deceive you into thinking God is answering your prayers. And then he make his petition. He was persistent in prayer. He never gave up. Grant me success this day. This day became day and night. It became many days. And by tomorrow, between three and four days. And in prayer, he made himself available. Lord, I'm willing to be used by you if I am the solution. Prayer changed his perspective. Yes, the problem is there, but God is awesome. It changed his priorities. Now I am no longer content with just serving the, the king food and drink, etc. Now I'm seeing that God wants me to do something bigger. Prayer gave him a new sense of purpose in life. This chapter also has lessons on how to know God's will for your life. How do you know God's will for your life? 
it begins with consecration. In verses 1 and verses 6 and 11, Nehemiah refers to himself as a servant, which means God is Lord, total surrender. Number two, he had genuine interest in the welfare of God's people. He cared about it. God would call you to work, to leadership, when you have a genuine burden for God and his work. When you seek counsel and prayers from godly people, in verse 11, Nehemiah was not the only one who prayed. Grant your servant and your servants who fear your name. So prayer, you look for like-minded people with the same burden. And then persistence in prayer. And then he waited for an open door. Divine providence. How do you know God is calling you? He's answering your prayer. He will give you an open door. In the case of Nehemiah, that day came. The king was the one who posed the question, what should I do for you? Clear, open door. I think we'll pause here. I guess you, 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 you get a train of thought. God is looking for leaders today. I believe you are the leader God has been waiting for. And the young men and women in Northern England, in God's wisdom and providence, you have been called at this particular time to take the initiative using technology to rally a generation together, a church without walls, to prepare our generation for Christ's second coming. We need leaders. And you are the answer. Whenever there is a problem, you are the answer. If you are smart enough to identify a problem in the church, in your community, in your country, at your workplace, once you find the problem, you are the solution. Make yourself available. And I know God will help each one of you. He will help each one of us in these last days. The walls are down crumbling walls at various levels. Where are the Nehemiahs? You are the Nehemiah. Let your prayer be like, like Nehemiah. Lord, make me the answer today. We'll bow down our heads for prayer. And after we pray, we are going to listen to that theme song, My Only Hope. Then after listening to that prayer song, we'll have one last comment for you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, today we begin a journey into what it takes to be a leader. Yeah, the walls are down, crumbling walls all around us. Our nations are in turmoil because of lack of leadership. Our parliaments and congresses, politicians are running the place, no leadership. Our institutions, our schools, our workplaces, our homes, Lord, the walls are down also. Even in our personal lives, the walls are crumbling. We need leaders. Thank God you are preparing each one of us to take the mantle. Thank you that this year, 2020, is the year you've designated to unleash upon the world a new generation of leaders. We thank you for what you are doing through the young men, students, young professionals in Northern England and across Europe. And because of them, the whole world has been rallied together. Throughout this week, speak to us. Open our eyes to see possibilities and make us willing. This is our prayer, Lord. Help us to claim you as our only hope. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. From early in the morning till late at night.
Oh. 